holds hierarchy is the center of it. There's some top topics that kind of are around it, but you know, I, I'm kind of mixed on that because I feel like we all do a lot of heavy lifting, connecting with collectors, selling art, making, you know, corporate connections, but it's not always advertised. So I wonder is that missing void that they talk about, is it because they don't document a lot of the sales and the things and the work we do? So because they don't hear about us, they don't think we're doing much or do you think just looking at it at face value with the museum collections of African-Americans, 1%, the corporate collections following that, is it just because we're not in their space that we're invisible? So that's uh, my own curiosity about you, you all's thoughts on that sub subject before we get Somebody else go ahead, because I talk too much sometimes. So yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious, Richard or Carla? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, I was just looking at our Houston Chronicle and they spotlight, you know, one article recently, five galleries to keep an eye on, and it's the same ones same. over and over again. But then I, I researched the writer of that article and then a previous article by another writer that happens to be in the circles of those particular galleries. So I mean, it's nepotism at times too, just who you're comfortable with nowadays. I mean, I know journalism isn't always the same. So Who's feeding them information? Are we doing our part to make sure that we're making those connections with media, with the people that are putting that information out there? I know, of course, we do our own marketing and our own social media and things like that, too. But are we just making sure that, hey, we're letting the right people know what's going on um, with my gallery? So kind of when we're having uh, exhibitions before COVID, that my sales, I rarely had sales from unknown people from my website. Um, it literally be one a month and I'm excited. So since COVID, I actually increased online sales from people I've never met before. So it surprised me that people were buying sight unseen. Number one, their home, they're spending more time in front of their home office looking at empty walls and let's wanting to support local, wanting to support um, black owned. It's kind of the touche thing to do right now. It's a popular thing to do right now. In Houston, I'm the only woman owned gallery. So I'm that together as well too, that not only black gallery black owned but i'm also the only woman gallery in houston um that's for profit we have some non-profit sisters doing some great things but i'm the only for-profit gallery in all of houston so mm -hmm. i put that out there and i had a lot of support people were just like we had no idea but i'll be honest i didn't start my gallery pushing black 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 because even though we have the black artists and the black art we i mean my gallery is showing everything mm -hmm. so um it's really getting a lot of push now from what's everything's going on. Gotcha. What about yeah. you, Richard? How you feel about that? Um, so from, from my standpoint, you know, all of our shows over the last couple of years have been completely sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue that we've run into is that, um, you know, expanding on our market, uh, you know, and a lot of the artists that we've worked with, they've been poached, you know, by some of the, um, by some of the larger, whiter galleries uh, where we put in all of the work, you know, the resources and, and uh, creating a market for these artists and building that market. Uh, and then we're not being given access to, um, to some of the top art fairs, you know, and these are the spaces and places that the artists want to be. And if we're not able to have access to be able to compete on that level, um, you know, it, it really, um, it makes it difficult for your program and it makes it difficult to be able to continue to build the artist's careers uh, so a lot of times these artists move on, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, you know, and, that, and that's been really difficult for us, you know, but through, um, you know, some of the artists remaining loyal to the program, uh, you know, and continuing to have us as their primary gallery, I've been able to, as you were saying earlier, Carla, I've been able to build some of these relationships and network, you know, so we've been able to tap into areas in the past that maybe we didn't have access to. And that's been extremely beneficial for us. Like in March, uh, we were in London. We were in Mayfair uh, because one of the artists, Genesis Tremaine, uh, she had a solo exhibition with Almi Reich Gallery. Uh, and the way that we were able to, uh, to, to negotiate that partnership was that I, my gallery remained the primary gallery for, here, for her over here in the States. And Almi Reich Gallery is her gallery over in London and Shanghai. Uh, and for the first number of shows, all of those works have to be consigned through my gallery. You know, so for me, it was really 
being able to figure out, you know, how do we approach it from a, a, a strategic standpoint, business wise, where we're not losing these artists that we help to put so much into to build their careers. So now these galleries can come in and poach them and be able to make and make all the money off of it and benefit from it. You know, and, um, you know, the issue too is like a number of the artists that came out of our gallery go to these other galleries and then these galleries are gaining entry into these art fairs, you know, so there's no transparency there. So it's like, well, what is the process? You know, what, what are you looking for in a gallery? Uh, what is it that my gallery or other galleries that are black owned that are filling out these applications and not being accepted in? What is it that they're not doing? You know, so there needs to be more transparency. Particularly since the same artists are getting accepted with other galleries. I mean, Absolutely, yeah. Artists. So now they're in a position to monetize this. And when you're talking about a smaller gallery and putting so much resources and time and effort into, into building a market for an artist's career, and then they finally get there and you lose them, and you're not able to see any of that compensation on the back end to a smaller gallery that can be that can be detrimental to their program mm -hmm. and some of them some of them never recover from it you know there's still really two art worlds there's still what they call the mainstream art world i'm gonna just say the white art world and there's still a black art world and so you know one of the things that that, that happens is now there's a bigger pathway for people to, to leave the black art world mm. and get into the white art world uh, that has been created. But I don't think that comparing our world to their world does us any good. Uh, I think we, we need access if we want to be able to do things. But we will always have a world where most of our artists are not going to be accepted by the white art world. Most of them. Some will, and Rich is able to develop. I mean, if I just look at the people who came through Rush 15 years ago and where they're at, the Kehindes, the Michelines, all that whole generation or before the generation of people that you were mentoring, they all are with these top galleries getting hundreds of thousands of dollars for these things. One of the problems that I have more than anything else uh, because my mission hasn't changed. Actually, my mission has changed, but I'll tell you about that in, in a different way. One of the things that is those artists do not look back mm. and try to remember and where, how they got a leg up, you know, and you know, for a place like Rush to be there, we need the support of those people who move on, okay. or we need corporate support. And so, you know, it's really frustrating when I reach out to people who had three or four solo shows at Rush and they got recognized and got into this program or that program or this program, and then they don't even return emails anymore. Mm -hmm. Some do, but more don't they do because they do not want to be associated with being with a black gallery. See, and that's where I, I felt like this, the truth really was, which is why I wanted to dig a little bit before we got started. So if you all don't mind, going back to some of those conversations once we get started because the hierarchy doesn't exist for us because they're not telling us, telling people where they came from. So yeah. they're almost like they're just being discovered, but they put in five, 10 years with different galleries that basically lifted them up. So I think that's important that we mention. So I, I've read so many bios with people uh, whose careers, they act like their career started at the studio museum. Right. A lot of these artists went to the studio museum program and like there was nothing before that but college. Yep. And you know, there's, there's a five year gap that they were at Rush and when nobody bought their work but me, you know, I got a great collection because I bought everybody's work because nobody else was buying it. Hey. And so, you know, and then they, when they don't answer my emails, I was like, we have your fundraiser, can, can you help? Can you donate something? And ghost. I'm like, really? Yeah, that's real. Really? I'm going to kick it off on that because I think this is really the heart and soul of what this conversation is really about. So I'm going to just go ahead and start off and welcome everyone to our webinar hosted by HMAC, courtesy of John Guest. He is the CEO Emeritus for the Houston Museum of African American Culture and also arranged this seminar and our amazing panelists. My name is Andre Guichard. I am 
an artist of 29 years, co-owner of Gallery Bouchard with my wife, Frances Bouchard and Stephen Mitchell. We've been creating platforms for collectors and artists to meet for 15 years now with a focus on art of the African diaspora and multicultural artists. We're excited about the decade long relationship with the Houston Museum of African American Culture as an exhibiting artist with my fellow panelist, Danny Simmons, about nine years ago and many years working with Danny and him on the Bombay Sapphire Artisan Series where HMAC was one of our museum partners from the beginning. And they produced several amazing artists that went on to our Basel and some of them actually won. Not as much as New York, Danny. I don't know what that was about, but you all keep producing that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a really good time. So today we are here to discuss an interesting topic. Black dealers missing from the art world's hierarchy. I'm very excited to discuss this conversation with this esteemed group of panelists who cumulatively, they have 45 years of gallerist experience amongst them. And together, the four of us have 60 years of gallery experience management, dealing with artists. So I'm very honored to be here with these legends and with that, I want to get started with introducing each of you, if you all can talk maybe three to five minutes about your journey and what you do before we get into some questions, and we can kick it off with you, Danny. Uh, my name is Danny Simmons. I, 25 years ago, I founded Rush Philanthropic Arts Foundation uh, in Chelsea, in New York. I had a couple of galleries before that, but that's, that's the significant landmark, uh, and we basically are a nonprofit that promotes arts for marginalized artists, mostly artists of color and, uh, and emerging artists. And we also have a lot of community programs like ch children's art education programs. I'm a, personally, I'm an artist, a poet, uh, and an, I guess an event producer. I created the television show Deaf Poetry uh, and, a, and a number of other platforms, but uh, the most fun I ever had was hanging out with Andre Jacquard, who <laughs> running the streets doing Bombay Sapphire in my art career. All right, I'm done. That's good enough. Yeah, that was that was huge, huge. Thank you, Danny. And next, Richard Beavers, uh, 13 years, and you know he keeps really good company because one of my favorite collectors, the McCrays, Nancy and Lorenzo, always speak highly of you. But I know you're doing great work. And without further ado, Richard Beavers. Uh, my name is Richard Beavers. I am the founder of Richard Beavers Gallery, which was established in 2007. Um, art, the gallery represents uh, emerging mid-career African-American artists and artists from the African diaspora. Uh, I created the gallery uh, because I'm a strong believer in if you build it, they will come. Uh, I wanted to bring artwork to a underserved community, which is in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area where I live. Uh, but most importantly, I wanted to create a platform for underrepresented artists where they have a space and a place to exhibit their work and to also use that as an opportunity to educate the Black, the black community when it comes to the importance of art. Uh, we do a lot of community outreach initiatives uh, looking to expose as many young people and families uh, to art uh, and making a gallery a space and a place where they feel comfortable coming to because at times a gallery can be really intimidating uh, and imposing, uh, we have an open door policy where you know all are welcome to come in and visit our space. Uh, the artwork uh, primarily addresses a lot of the uh, socio political issues that are prevalent on a daily basis in a lot of the black communities uh, throughout this country. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. And from Houston, Texas, Carla B. Song, seven years now, and the only African American owned female gallery in Houston, is that correct? Yes, the only for-profit uh, gallery owned by a woman in Houston. And again, thank you for having me on. It's such an honor to meet all of you and talk with the guests. Um, my name is Carla B. Song, and I've had the gallery uh, seven years. It's been a very up and down, and exciting um, and scary experience, but I've loved it every step of the way. So I was considered an outsider when I started. I didn't uh, work in a museum before or ever work in a gallery before, but I've always loved the arts, always had artist friends. My background was corporate America. I worked for 
uh, Merrill Lynch for seven years in 2008, got laid off along with a lot of other people during that downturn. And so I said, well, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something I'm passionate about. So I decided to open a gallery and um, communicate with all my artist friends that said that they would reach out to other galleries and wouldn't even get a courtesy rejection letter, just like wouldn't even hear back. And so I said, well, you know, that doesn't seem like that's fair to people who don't have a quote unquote name yet. So at the end of the day, I can open a space. I can become that platform to connect this true talent that's not being seen in our area with people that don't know much about art, but I could be the educator and connect the two. So I just figured I'd start it and see what happens. And seven years later, so I've learned a lot around, along the journey and I'm still, still going, still doors open and still loving it every day. Congratulations, particularly during a recession and COVID, you're still yeah. around. I'm mm -hmm. sure you all heard 41% of African-American businesses have already closed. So mm -hmm. the uh, business of culture and still around is, is amazing which really brings us to the meat of this conversation. And the first question, and I'll pose the question and give everyone a chance, three to five minutes to dive into it. If you need more time, take it, because I think this topic is very, very important. And the first question is, what is the place today of black artists in the art world today? And you can break that down. Is it one or two worlds? Anything you think applies to the place of the black artist today. And we'll start with you, Danny. Well, I mean, I don't know if there's any one real particular place for black art. I do know that their voices right now across the world are resonating as a group much more loudly than anybody else. The artists of Africa, the African-American artists, we, they, we, I'm gonna say we because I am an artist also, uh, are being sought after like never before. Uh, and so the, the places at the forefront of the art world, I mean, the prices, even though, you know, um, white male artists dominate in the amount of sales and the, 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 the amount of money art sold for, the excitement in the art world right now is black artists and they're being sought out like never before. Uh, but that being said, there are so many Black artists uh, who are not being seen, not being heard, uh, who depend on uh, community galleries, galleries that are looking to open their doors for them to get exposure, that they might be seen. Um, so I, I don't think that the integration of the art world, even though more people are are, are, are walking through the door into the so-called mainstream art world is necessarily going to help the black arts grow or prosper. It will help some, some artists grow or prosper. But in my opinion, one of the purposes, and I think Richard put it before, is to expose not only artists for space, but also expose our community to arts. And it's one of the reasons why Rush is there, because it's not only the artists, but the audience that needs the education in art. And my big thing with the foundation is art is a very healing thing. And so, you know, the fact that when I moved to Philadelphia, I chose a neighborhood with no other cultural resources even makes what we do more important than when I was in Chelsea. When I was in Chelsea, I was another gallery, even though I was the only black gallery. I was, well, no, that's not true because it was Skoto also. But the, the, I, it's more important to me and to my foundation that we're in a place it makes a difference where people can see art, and particularly are uh, poor and don't really leave their neighborhoods. And so to walk down the street and look through the window and see a black artist and black art and be welcoming is a healing thing for that community. So, I mean, I think that we are on, many are on the cusp of, of outer world greatness, but I think many are concerned about how we can use arts to be helpful and healing to who we are as a people. Love it. Thank you, Danny. Richard, what, um, what is the place of black artists in the world today? Um, you know, there, there's several places. Uh, I guess one of the places would be that they are, you know, the documenters of our story and our history. Um, you know, they're, they're communicators and that's extremely important. 
uh, but it's also important for uh, those whose stories that they're documenting that they have access to the work. You know, um, like Danny said, you know, a little while ago, where you don't have to always leave outside of your community to be able to have access to your culture. Uh, you know, so I feel that a place for uh, artists of color is to also be a voice, you know, to, to be a voice in understanding the leverage that they yield uh, and not always have to, um, you know, cater to uh, what they feel is necessary for them to be able to gain access or to have whatever they define maybe as being successful, you know, within the, uh, you know, the contemporary fine art world, uh, you know, for them to um, not only look for opportunity for themselves, but also look to open doors for others, uh, you know, and to not, um, not to compromise you know, the importance of, of their voice, uh, you know, through, through uh, uh, creative measures, you know, because it's not just important with the artwork that you're creating, um, but it's also important with, with what your stance is, you know, and what you're looking or willing to compromise to get to maybe where it is that you feel that you should be. Uh, it's important to support those spaces and places that are um, cultural, uh, you know, centers within the community, uh, you know, such as Rush Art and all of the phenomenal artists that have come through that program, you know, it's important for these artists to say to their galleries, listen, I understand that we have a business relationship, but there wouldn't be a business relationship if it wasn't for Rush Art, if it wasn't for Richard Beaver's gallery, if it wasn't for some of these other pioneering galleries that create these opportunities for these artists that you are so, you know, that you, um, that are so sought after, you know, in this day. Um, you know, African-American art is, is very undervalued, you know, so when you are talking about the white art world and collectors and the next, um, the next particular genre of art that they're looking to monetize, the place to go would be to African-American art because it's so undervalued, so there's a lot of room uh, for growth. You know, so if you're going to invest in anything, then you invest in these group of artists and then you get behind these group of artists and you control their market. And if you control their market, then those that are in control of it can completely monetize it. You know, so the place for artists, I would say, and particularly black artists, is that they have to begin to understand the business aspect of this and how our cultural capital is being monetized by others outside of our community. Uh, so place for me, once again, is understanding all of the levels to this and not just using blackness when it's convenient for you, but understanding that the usage of blackness is supposed to be beneficial to all of us. Right. Very well said. Thank you, Richard. So Carla, what do you think the place of black artists in the world today is? Annie and Richard gave such explanations. Uh, that's amazing. Um, I'll just communicate a few conversations I've had with local artists that when I really like to listen to how they're feeling, what's going on, and many are feeling that they a lot of times want credit for the things that maybe they originated or they um, have been doing. And we've noticed, and it could possibly also be this is Texas, but when it comes to large commissions, maybe right now a lot of mural projects are going up. So the art that's being created to document what's going on right now are being given to non-Black artists, but then the subject matter is George Floyd and, you know, what's going on in the media. And it's like, okay, but when you spend these $30,000 to do these large projects, Honestly, sometimes they're not even given to the black artists to communicate what's going on in the black community. So um, along with what Danny and Richard said, that's just a conversation that is so frustrating that before it's been highly publicized, um, what current events are going on, certain artists have been communicating that Black Lives Matter, been communicating um, what's going on with police brutality, been communicating the injustice in Texas, I mean, because you know, we're in Texas. So, and then when it's communicated to let's put that voice out there, who are the artists being selected to put their name on the pieces and being shown and everyone's looking back, oh, isn't that wonderful? And the artists that have been saying these things and creating these images and telling these stories aren't even being acknowledged. Mm. So while there's a lot more attention 
being given to the black artists, there's still a lot of room, it sounds like, for more black artists to get a chance. Is that something we all agree with? Certainly that. Um, you know, beyond the chance, you know, when we talk about, you know, the emergence or the, the, the rise of black artists at the prime, if if a black artist, except for one or two, sells for two or three hundred thousand dollars, which seems like a lot to us compared to what we would sell in a, out of our galleries in the community. There's another artist, the same age, the same background, that's a white male artist who's selling for two million dollars, two and a half million dollars. So there, as Richard said, there is such a undervalue of black artists. Even when you start hearing about somebody so-and-so works over $250,000, it's like a pittance compared to what, what other artists are. So we're even lagging when we get entry to the mainstream art world. We're, we're not being traded at the same level as those people at, in, in mainstream art world. So I think that's, that's a problem that, you know, um, exists, you know, especially for collectors. <laughs> You agree, Richard? There's a lot of hype, but we're still not getting the amount of opportunities we should, given the talent in our community. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I lost connection for a second. Can you ask the question again, please? I'm sorry. I was asking what your thoughts are regarding while all this attention right now is being given to Black art as a whole, are we still receiving as much attention as we should as it relates to real opportunities? I don't, I don't think it's ever been set up, you know, for us to receive that type of attention. Mm. Um, you know, that, that's just, whether you're talking about the art industry, you know, or, or other industries in general, you know, we, we tend to always, you know, be the laborers, you know, the entertainers, um, you know, the, 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 the capital, you know, um, but when you look at ownership, you know, how many of us are really in position of ownership, which is in a position to be in, of power, you know, um, and I just always go back to speaking to it again. It's just that, you know, our artists have to begin to understand and have a, have a better understanding of the business and a commitment and, and, uh, and how you leverage that. Uh, you know, because it's hard to sit down and have a conversation with these with these corporations, uh, with these art fairs, uh, you know, with the collectors, if the artists are not committed to the program or to the black galleries or, you know, the black cultural institutions. You know, once that is in order, you know, then the business minds, you know, such as myself and, and Danny and, and yourself and Carla can come in and then we can have these conversations, you know, because a lot of our artists are being exploited. You know, they're being locked into these contracts that are not beneficial to them. Uh, they're, they're, they're giving up a lot and receiving very little in return. And there are no uh, measures in place to protect them. You know, so once again, it's not necessarily just speaking about the sales of the art, but it's also protecting an artist's career, you know, and making certain that they're not looking at this from a short term position, but it's more so from a longevity standpoint, you know, so that that artist has things, has certain things in place like um, acquisition agreements, you know, knowing where your work is being sold to, uh, knowing that that work won't be put back onto the secondary market for a certain number of years so that now this young artist is not competing with work that they pre-sold with current work that they're, that they're, that they're, that they're currently creating you know, and understanding how to price your work, understanding when you should increase the value of your work, uh, how many works per year should you produce, what shows should your work be exhibiting at. You know, these are the things that a lot of our artists are not going to be taught by these galleries because the, the, the more naive they are and the less informed they are when it comes to business, then the more beneficial it is to that gallery and those individuals that are collecting the work. Um, you know, so the, the, the better of a position that you put us in to protect you and to protect your career, then the more we're able to do, you know, and these are the conversations that we're not having, 
even myself and Danny and Carla and you, I mean, we, we should be talking more often. You know, it shouldn't come down to a Zoom call, you know, for us to not be in constant communication and not to have a list of the black galleries throughout the country. So now when I've already, I've already solidified maybe the New York market for my artists, I can hit you up and say, hey, hey man, I have this incredible artist. Um, Carla, I have this really amazing artist and I really need to build out this artist market. Mm -hmm. you know, can we consider doing a show at your gallery and doing a show at your gallery, Carla? You know, and we'll work out all, this, all of the specifics and then vice versa. How many artists are looking to tap into the New York market mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and are looking for that type of opportunity? And when we're not able to present these opportunities to, to artists that we're representing, then we leave them you know, in a, in a space and place where they're like, hey, you know what, I have to, maybe I have to look to do these things for myself because my gallerist is not providing these opportunities to me. So, and Carla, I'd like you to uh, speak to that and then I want to ask another question about this because I think it's moving to something really juicy. Is there something as it relates to that question that you want to add or would you like me to go on? Uh, I just want to agree that I think that's a great idea. And years ago, galleries did that often to form relationships and mix market and switch with artists. I mean, I think that is an amazing idea. And I was curious why hasn't that been, I mean, how come that either ended or, you know, I would love to do some research to find out because that was a popular thing that was done. And again, I'm the newcomer on the block. So I've been in the business just seven years. So I'm sure there's still more I need to learn, but I, I don't know why that slowed down because that was something that was popular. And all of us here have power enough that we can do that. So I'm, I'm going to keep speaking on that because we should, because I think that ties into another issue, which you spoke on briefly, Richard and Danny, we were talking about it, which is the anointment of some of our stars from our community that go to higher levels. To your point, Danny, not 20 or 30,000, but hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that's happening, but they're not giving credit in some cases to the galleries that help them get their start. So is the anointment of our artists by others that aren't in the community, that aren't a part of lifting these artists up a problem and how can we do something about it where we are part of the anointment of these artists that rise to the top because we've done the work, they have followings all over the country and I've seen it and we've talked about it. Sometimes you think these artists just started off, but we know they've had histories where they got to that point. So Danny, you could start off about your thoughts about, and I'll, I'll call it the Sammy Davis syndrome. We all know there were a lot of great entertainers when Sammy Davis was around, but we only knew it's Sammy Davis. I think that's <laughs> happening in our world. And part of it is because we aren't choosing the artists that are ready to go to that level, or maybe it's because we're not organizing enough to make the choice. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Start with you, Dan. Well, from my perspective, I mean, one of the things is, and this is not an indictment of anybody. I think the art, a lot of the artists that make it are really self-focused a lot. They don't, as artists, they are entirely focused on their own careers and see whatever it could be black, white, or whatever gallery that they're at as a stepping stone to somewhere. And so they don't really develop a loyalty to any particular thing other than their own career. And so I think, and, and conversely, I think that a lot of galleries outside of the ones that have a consciousness like the ones that we, we create in our communities are very predatory. And so what happens is they will use that artist for as much as they will. I've seen an artist that came from Rush change galleries three times, major galleries, major mainstream galleries, in one year, because they get a better offer, a better offer, a better offer. And so I don't think, I think one of the things that we as a community need to do is think beyond ourselves and what our impact could be on changing the dynamic for African Americans in this country and how art is integral changing that dynamic in communities and, and, uh, and, and with other people. I mean, artists are, are amongst our spokesperson. So if they speak out, 
and and say, I'm here not only for myself, but to help other artists or to help our community, that gets heard by a certain powerful segment of our community, collectors. And so, you know, they have money. The people who collect art have a certain amount of money, most of them. And so that means they're in positions of power. And so when the when the word goes out that we are doing this not only for ourselves, but we're doing this for community and, and the betterment of our people, and that art is a tool for that, I think changes will start to happen. But I think that needs to be discussed because what's, what's being taught in the art world is how you get your own career started. And people don't re realize when you rise, you can bring others with you. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna hold you back. And the idea people have, well, if I hold on to this, it will hold me back instead of help push me forward. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's just a consciousness change that needs to happen, not only with this, but it's across all industries. But we're talking about art, so it's, it's prevalent for us to see that sort of thing. But you know, I'm gonna, before I go into Richard, you said something that's interesting. These are artists of color, African-American artists. So how can the history of black galleries that have helped you be something you're ashamed of? So it's really an interesting, dichotomy when you think of it. You're black, or you're of color, so why would these great institutions be something you're ashamed of? But the reality is these clean slates, and I've seen it too, so I, I just thought that was interesting, that point. Yeah, well, it's, nobody wants to be, you know, when, when, we, when the art world thinks of black galleries, they think of inferior, this, that, and the other general art world. They don't think that the same type of standards that they supposedly have, that we have, that we employ. And so if the person that's feeding them at the moment has negative connotation of black galleries, it's, it's hard for a lot of people to fly in the face of what's being put at you when your livelihood is at stake. Mm. So people don't challenge things. They let things go. They might disagree. But they let it go. Mm -hmm. And that, that's how they get along. And that's how we've been getting along collectively as a group for a very long time, by just by letting microaggressions or macroaggressions go. Just let it go, as long as it's not affecting you personally. And so, you know, it, it comes back to self-empowerment, standing up for our community, and it just goes across the board. That's mm. Richard, I'm, I know you've got some great uh, advice around this, particularly with the loyalty of artists to galleries. How do you feel that all comes together on this piece? Um, to, to just um, briefly build off of what Danny said, it, you know, it took me a long time to really come to this realization that um, a lot of the artists that work or have worked with the gallery or represented through the gallery, they were there because they only felt that, that they felt that, that, that we were their only option. You know, so I think that when other opportunities become available, then the artists are gone. You know, they're only there because that is what is available to them. You know, but they've never had the intentions on staying with the program. The program was only to bring some visibility to them. Uh, so one of the things that we've been able to do to kind of shift that is to try to educate the artists as much as we possibly can about the importance of black owned galleries and, and black cultural institutions and the history that we have played along with the black artists and what we've been able to accomplish and the doors that we've been able to open that has created opportunities for all of us. Right. You know, so that there is a more of a level of consciousness and understanding that, yes, the goal is, if this is what you are seeking, is for you to move on to, let's say, more prosperous opportunities, because unfortunately, the other man's ice always seems to be colder. So if that is what your objective is, we can help you and assist you in accomplishing that so the foundation will be in place. But there has to be a sense of loyalty to your heart and soul gallery so that those other artists that are coming behind you that these institutions will continue to exist to be in position to create these opportunities. And then many of our galleries are more than just commercial galleries. We are community centers, mm -hmm. you know, with fundraisers, uh, uh, art classes for kids, 
you know, you, I mean, there are things that we are doing because we are culturally connected to our communities. Um, you know, so in doing those things, you know, we've been able to establish a sense of loyalty with the artists that we've represented. So now when they've been approached by other galleries, they're not going at it by themselves. They're saying, this is what the deal is. I need to make certain that my, my heart and soul gallery is going to be discussed in this conversation and I need to maintain this relationship. And that could mean that they give exclusivity to one of these galleries, but a simple thing like I'm going to make certain that Carla, Andre, Danny, Richard, that they receive two works a year. Two works a year. Two works a year have to go back to this program that I am committed to so that this program can not only continue to exist, but it can continue to grow and create opportunities because they're just too important to the black community. And if that gallery that is interested in you tells you no, then you know that that's a place that you maybe you don't need to be at. You know, so it's a consciousness. It's a commitment. You know, um, I, I've never really been able to grasp how so many of this, these artists' works can speak to these issues, but they don't live these issues. Mm. It, 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 has, it, it really has puzzled me. And black collectors, it's not just up to us, but black collectors also need to step up and be a voice. You know, I had, I had a black collector recently tell me, I do not buy black art from white galleries. Mm. I refuse to do it. So when the collectors speak up, and then, and then they become a voice for us. That also empowers us. And it gives us a little bit more leverage. You know, so we have to come together as a community and, and, and be responsible for each other and not just say as a collector, yo, all I want to do is access the work. So whatever I need to do, whoever I need to kiss up to, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make certain that I do that because I just want the work. So it's activism, not just with the galleries, but everybody has a part. With, ev with everybody on every level, there needs to be that type of commitment. Um, and, and this doesn't just apply to the art world. You know, it, it's a reason why we tend to find ourselves on the outside, you know, because we're not organized. So um, you know, and, and, one, and one other thing, Andre, even, even when we look at when we look at the staff of a lot of these galleries that these artists are going to, mm -hmm. you know, how can, how can a gallery be building their program off of black artists or moving it in that direction? So now you look at some of the top artists on these rosters, but you don't have any black people working at these programs, at these mm -hmm. galleries. Mm -hmm. And the artists don't, don't, don't seem to have an issue with that. Good point. Good point. <laughs> It, it, it takes, as they say, it takes a village. How do you feel about that, Carla? Um, like I said, when I started, I came from outside world and started a gallery without experience working in a gallery or museum. So what I did was go to a lot of art forums online to research what are the major complaints artists have with galleries so that I can learn what not to do. So I started there and what I learned many times was not feeling, a, the artist not feeling a sense of connection with the dealers, with the galleries they were with, some of the more established, some of the bigger galleries. So I knew when I started my gallery, you're one of the artists I represent, you're family, and I'm gonna make sure you feel like family. I remember one person in one of the online communities complained and a su substantial piece sold and they found out on social media because the buyer, you know, posted and was excited and many people shared it, many people shared it and they saw that it sold, but the buyer had time to, you know, put it up, post it, people share it. And it's like, why did I have to find out a significant piece sold by online instead of, you know, my deal or my gallery calling me? I know I'm the first one. As soon as the, the buyer walks out the door and the credit card statement goes through I'm ready to celebrate I'm calling and guess what we sold you know and it's you know the artist is excited I'm excited and it's just like calling one of my best friends calling a family member to just celebrate you know because art is their baby and there are sometimes some artists come in and I have the white gloves and I'm being super cautious with it and they're like oh it's fine put it over there I'm like no 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 this is <laughs> this is your baby we're gonna you know respect it so 
I think I have a lot of loyalty well, also uh, just because of how I'm treating others and how I'm treating the work and how seriously I'm taking this. And if a piece sells for 300 bucks or a piece sells for, you know, a lot more thousands and thousands of dollars, you're still getting a phone call from me excited that, you know, a piece sold and it's appreciated on both sides. So I just want to say that that's very important. The relationship that's built mm -hmm. and making sure my artists don't feel like a, a number and they feel like a connected person in my life that I care about. You know, I, I just want a personal experience um, that relates to connection to a gallery. So I, I, years ago, I did a big show with a, a major old school white glove gallery. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, out the gallery's name. And the New York Times reviewed it and we sold a few works and they represented me. I signed a piece of paper and all of that. And so about a year later, they got like 30 works in the basement. And so like a year later, they do a big art fair. And I look on the list of the artists and I wasn't on it. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm your new artist. You got 30 of my works sitting in the basement and you're not gonna bring at least one of my works to this art fair. Mm -hmm. And so, so, well, you know, you'll have to wait your turn. So I immediately terminated my, my relationship with that gallery. I don't know if it helped me or hurt me. Maybe I should have waited a little, little longer, but I felt betrayed, you know, that this gallery did not have enough um, thoughtfulness of my career, that they would sit 30 works in the basement that they had exclusive rights to and then not show them at a major art fair. Uh, the other point I want to bring out is when we talk about community and art, you know, when, I, when Rush first started out, the, the idea was the, to represent a, a, a showcase, instead of represent, to showcase emerging Black artists and female artists and artists who were not in the mainstream and art education for children. As I moved to Philadelphia and saw, and where I located my gallery, I bought the building and this, that. Where I located my gallery, I realized what had happened in Clinton Hill with Corridor Gallery and how that played into the change in that neighborhood. Some, some say for good, some say for bad because gentrification hit that neighborhood so hard. And a lot of people said, well, if you hadn't put that gallery there and made it acceptable because it used to be the hood. Uh, I realized what a, what a force for neighborhood, if managed right, what a force for neighborhood revitalization a gallery can be just to have a gallery somewhere in the middle of a neighborhood that, that needs revitalization. When you introduce something like that, some culture and it's consistent and everybody is invited, not just the people from the outside coming there. You know, they're not just white people coming to the hood to look at art or not just artists coming, but grandma and grandpa from down the street, the dude who stands around the corner and drinks some beer. You know, we change at least a few blocks around there, they stopped drinking in front of that building. They stopped doing this. They would pick up paper in front of that building. We had a whole different relationship with that community because we were there, because we were appreciated. People who had never been anywhere, didn't go to the museums downtown, never been to a gallery. Some, maybe the kid that went to a museum in some sort of school program, but to have some place where they could go on a Saturday morning and learn art, it made a difference to that neighborhood. It gave some pride to that neighborhood. And then I created with mural arts. They said, where do you want your mural? They were looking at downtown. I said, no, I want my mural in that neighborhood because there were no murals in that neighborhood. And so we have to ride and, you know, for our community. And we have to tell these people who want our art, this has to be done over here, you know? And so that's why I got a second mural coming up. And they said, where do you want it? I said, I want it in some neighborhood that does not have a lot of art that, and so it's about a mile from the first one, a different name neighborhood, but it's the same situation. It's a black neighborhood that's so-called marginalized. And so when we put ourselves into these neighborhoods, we can bring audiences to it. The little restaurants in the neighborhood get a boost. Everybody gets a boost by our presence. So, you know, I changed my mission to community revitalization through the arts. Love it. So that brings me to my next question, which is the importance of Black galleries to our communities. And you touched on it, Danny, uh, Danny, changing neighborhoods. But what do you think, Richard? 
in addition to helping these artists with launch pads, what are some of the other benefits of our galleries to our communities? Um, one of the benefits is just access to the arts. You know, um, if it wasn't for Savico Gallery, you know, when I was a teenager, uh, that, that was the first, and that was a, a gallery that was owned by, you know, two women from the Caribbean, and it was um, in the village. And this is when I was a teenager, you know, and my mother took me there to that gallery. And that was the first time that I had ever seen anything like that. All of these black images, you know, hanging on the wall, uh, artwork that was telling my story. So that was the first time that I really had a close connection to art. Uh, going to Clinton Hill Simply Art and Framing, going to Corridor Gallery, going to Dorsey's Gallery. You know, the, this is where, you know, my vision came from. You know, to see that these spaces and places were owned by black people, you know, it gave me the belief that this is something that I would be able to accomplish if I chose so. You know, the, the path was already set for me. Um, you know, art opened up my life, my eyes to the world of possibilities. You know, so when I opened the gallery, I was just taking a formula that was already put in place, you know, and, and, and carrying the baton. You know, I wanted to make that same impact for that young kid that walked into my gallery and the pride that I felt. You know, I remember, I always remember this, man. Danny in, in Corbett Gallery, he had this serograph of Jacob Lawrence. And it was uh, like kind of like an abstract image of Jacob working at his bench, you know, and Jacob- I still got that up in my bedroom. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you, you know, you, I mean, you know, that, that, was, that was that moment for me, you know, and Jacob became one of my favorite artists. And then I began to study Jacob, um, you know, so I also learned history through art. You know, mm -hmm. um, art helped to build my confidence. You know, that's one of the reasons why we do the, the art classes for kids in the gallery. Every time we have an exhibition, um, you know, we go out and we buy all the art materials and the artists who's exhibiting, they do a free art class for the kids in the community. You know, all of the, 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 the funding for arts programming has been taken away or out of our schools. So why are we waiting for someone else to do the things that we can do? That doesn't mean that we don't stop putting pressure, you know, to get the resources that we need. But the galleries and the cultural institutions are the spaces and places that, that have the capabilities of doing these things when we partner with the artistic world. Um, it's also a place to come to where, where you can have a sense of pride. You know, I can't tell you how many people walk into that gallery and, and you know, they walk, they, they walk into the gallery, and number one, they can't believe it's in bed stop. You know, and they don't even feel that they are welcome or good enough to come into the gallery, but now they're regulars. You know, I always tell a little funny story, man, one of my biggest clients, First time he came into the gallery, this, at this time I was selling posters, you know, frame limited editions. And when he asked me the price, I think I told him 800. And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, man, you are out of your mind. You know, and this was 12 years ago. And he says that when he walked out of the gallery, he was like, yo, that brother will never survive here. It's not gonna happen. And now he's been with me for 13 years. I've seen his daughters grow up. He, he purchases art and I've educated him about it, you know, so it's just there's so many people that you meet, you know, and the work that's hanging in their homes that now people are going to come into their homes and see that work. And then for the first time, they may be introduced to art. And it all leads back to the vision that we had and understanding the importance and the significance of art and for all people to have access to it. Mm. Carla, why is it so important? Take it. Take it. <laughs> I I just look back and look at my experiences going growing up and coming through schools and middle school and I think in middle school and in high school we took that create a personality test that would talk about what profession you should go into and it said that I'm a creative I have no idea how I got into finance but anyway it said my personality is creative so it said interior designer or something with fashion and something like that but Never on any of those tests did it say anything about an art dealer, anything in that form. So that's not, it's still, I don't think, mainstream for what we do as a profession 
to be well known or even encouraged to the kids. So Richard, I can respect what you're saying because we also do a lot of community events as much as possible pre-COVID uh, events for the kids and want them exposed to arts. Um, with this, when schools were kids were all going and we had a small few doing homeschool, we wanted to have art classes for the kids that did homeschool so that they made sure or to get their, you know, creative learning and the arts going on. But um, that I feel it's so important for black galleries to be shown that this is also a profession that you can take seriously and you can go into. Many people ask me two questions when they meet me. How did you get started? And what exactly do you do? How does this even work? From young kids, which I love answering, and college students, I'm not too far from a, um, U of H downtown. So I get a lot of college students coming in. I'm excited to talk to them. But just anyone with all professions are like, how does this even work? So it's a lot of education that we need to give to show people what the average person that's not involved in the arts. For me, I'm excited that I've sold many people their first original piece. They didn't think that they could buy something hand created by a person. They, you know, let me just go to the design store, the furniture store and buy the print that's on the wall. And it's like, no, you can, <laughs> you can buy something that's uh, original that you're not going to go to your friend's house and see the same print that they have. True. So it's clear for all of us. And you see the same experience here in Bronzeville corners that were drug spots or just dilapidated. Art comes into the community, property values go up. So our value is so great that, you know, we add value to the cultural, the aesthetic, right. and the economic vitality of a community. But the challenges that we face are really multifaceted. And I'm going to state a couple uh, recent polls and facts and then back into how do you, given these circumstances, work and survive in this Black, owning a Black art gallery in a mainstream world. And the, the first one is a recent survey about the wealth of African Americans compared to Caucasians right now. And you've probably seen it on CNN and SNBC, they flash it a lot, but it is different than the wealth disparity when King was here. He speaks in some of his speeches about double, but right now the net worth, the average net worth of African Americans right now is 17,000, the average. So that's the middle baseline. Mm -hmm. The average net worth for Caucasians right now is 171,000. So you've got two worlds, Danny spoke about it earlier, two worlds, two art markets. Most of our clients are more than likely in the upper 50% of that median of 17,000, clearly. And we have probably a good handle on the markets in most of our communities. But given the fact that the mainstream's median net worth is 171,000. There's just a lot more people over 171, and even the ones below are still candidates for our galleries. So given that statistic and the other statistic of 78% of the people in museums are white men, and I think women, white women, 10.8%, Asian men, 7.5%, and Hispanic, Latinx men, 2.6%, and all other groups, including African Americans, are less than 1%. And unfortunately, the corporate collections mirror that. So given those challenges of economic disparities because of institutionalized racism, how do you approach a market and survive for so many years, given those facts? And I'll start with you, Danny. Well, as I said, you know, earlier, I, I'm a nonprofit. So a lot of that, what you just brought up, you know, I'm not dependent upon sales to keep going. So I'm just, I'm depending on being able to raise money from a myriad of sources. Um, so, I mean, when, when we talk about my challenge, let me put it this way. My challenge is more to involve those people who are making the 17,000 or less in culture. And 
for them to understand that this is for them. That is my biggest challenge, that poor people don't think things are for them. You know, and they think, you know, and then the, the general thing is that art is somehow elitist and, you know, so the, the conceptions around, perceptions, not conceptions, the, the perceptions around who art is for is my biggest challenge as a nonprofit gallery to get these people who walk by and look in and then hurry away because they don't feel like they want it to get them. We go out in the street and say, come on in. Or well, how much do I got to pay? No, you don't have to pay anything. We just want you to see the art. And they say, like, oh, well, maybe I'll come back. And then the next time they might come in. Then the next time they might bring their child in. So, you know, you know, I'm not as concerned as you guys are about selling art as I am about exposing art to a community. Because that's my mission, exposing art to a community and also allowing artists to have a platform in the beginning or at any point in their career, really, but mostly in the beginning, to show their work somewhere. Now, one of the things that I'm challenged and not even conflicted, but challenged with is getting people who can't afford to not, maybe not buy it, but come see it, that can move them to another place. I get a lot of museum people to come to Rush. I get a lot of, you know, community people who have access to different things. I have, first thing I did when I got here, I set up a relationship with the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Mural Arts Program, the African American Museum, and, um, and the, uh, another one, oh, the Bonds Foundation. I have done programs with all these people involving community and this and that. So allowing people to have access to resources that I don't have. And so, you know, I came with the name also. You know, oh, you're bringing Rush Arts. You know, it was a big article in the newspaper, Danny's coming to Philly with Rush Arts. So, you know, people were anticipating it. And so I've been, I've had a lot of support for, for my mission here. So, I mean, but the challenge is to get people who don't think things are for them to realize that the only reason we are there is for them. So diversifying and accessing grants and different programs that also allow you to still give service to that community that so badly needs culture. And I, I, I respect Yeah, that. I mean, grants, grants, it took me a few years to get my first grant here. There's a perception uh, that I don't need it just because of the last name which is completely wrong, um, that we exist on donations and grants and not, not infusions of money from my brother uh, or, or my brothers. Um, so, I mean, and then also they had to see for the first few years, I'm only here for going on four and a half years. So they had to see really how we were going to set up and what we were going to do. If we were going to last, this, that, and the other. Because people thought I would never last in that neighborhood. Same with Richard when he first opened in Bed-Stuy. Like, well, why are you way over there was the first question. I was like, this is where we need to be. Uh, so we started getting grants. Our first grant, we partnered with the African American Museum on a community engagement grant. And so we set up you know, the building that I, I got has had two spaces. Now it's two galleries, but it once where I first used it for a residency program for that grant. And so we had two artists stationed there working with the communities for them to see that this art is for them. So we did that grant with the African American Museum of Philadelphia. And then we reached out and we got a couple of other grants, this, that, and the other. So our grants are not totaling the type of, we never got a lot of grants, even in New York, we had sponsorships. Okay. And, and, and so we're starting to get people interested in sponsorship again. Uh, but most of my money has come from in the last four years, from art sales on at Artsy and Artnet, some artists do remember and give back. Like Hank Willis Thomas, every year gives a great piece, and, you know, and, and, and Sanford Biggers, and over these, there are a lot of those artists that do more. Don't, but a few of them know the importance of it, especially those artists whose work is around community. Like like Hank, that's all his work is about. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and he came from a family that is about community, you know, with Deb Willis and all of that. So, I mean, there are people that have been constant supporters of ours that have helped us stay afloat. And then my ability to talk to people and raise money um, in crowdsourcing, like, 
like I said, I just raised twenty three thousand dollars. So you know that'll that'll carry us three months at the level that we're at. You know, I don't. I basically don't charge anything for the galleries right now. Uh, the building has some some place upstairs, some apartments. So you know, I bought it to set it up so it was self sustaining. If I never got another dime, if I went up there and held up stuff myself, that we would have something there. Nice, Richard. With all those things set up against you, how have you been able to make it 13 years? You know, stack against the odds, so to speak. Um, well, you know, with us knowing that uh, historically we haven't had access, um, you know, to to capital. You know, we, we can't typically walk into a bank, you know, and apply for a loan and be granted that loan. Uh, you know, so for me, uh, I interned very early on. You know, I interned with Ms. Brown from Clinton Hill Simply Art Gallery. Um, I worked with Leroy Campbell, you know, who was another mentor of mine. Uh, you know, so I, I go back 20 plus years, you know, I say 13 years, but we're talking literally almost 30 years that I've been doing this. Uh, you know, I traveled with Leroy around the country and we did October Gallery and, you know, so that was my education where someone else may have gone to school. My schooling was, you know, my mentors and, and, and learning hands on, um, you know, but uh, that still didn't prepare me for everything that I was going to learn when I decided to rent that commercial space and open those doors <laughs> and, and go into the world of, of being a gallerist. You know, that, that was a whole nother animal. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So, but one of the things that I did know was my location. I wanted it to be in a community where I wanted to service our people. Um, but I knew that the overhead couldn't be too high. You know, so very early on, you know, we, we, we had to sell art. But, you know, we weren't looking at ten, twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000 a month in rent. You know, so the rent was, was, was fairly reasonable. Um, we were able to negotiate a long-term lease, you know, so that we didn't have to be concerned with having to relocate once we began to get the business going. Um, also took into consideration, we work with a lot of emerging artists. So when we're bringing those artists in, their works are not priced at these higher, at these higher price points. And understanding what collectors were looking for. You know, you have collectors who are purchasing for cultural reasons. You have co uh, collectors that are co purchasing for personal reasons. And then you have those that may be looking at it from an investment standpoint or all three. You know, so identifying that, um, understanding that you need a different price point, you know, for each particular, you know, each particular uh, collector and what it is that they're looking for. Uh, we were very creative where we rented the space out very early on. You know, so that was some of the additional revenue streams that we were bringing in. Uh, I mean, we, I even created a film festival, you know, where we put a projector in with a screen. I think Danny might, might have come to one of those uh, screens. Yeah. So now we're still staying within the, 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 the structure of um, creativity and arts. So we're not doing things that are going to take us outside of being looked at as a respectable gallery. You know, so even when it came to our rentals, we were very selective with the type of rentals that we had because we wanted to use it as an opportunity to bring those individuals in that would possibly collect art. You know, so it goes back to the creativity aspect of it. Um, I understood that I was the brand and that people were purchasing art, but they were also purchasing the vision of Richard Beavers and supporting what it was that I represented and how important they felt that the gallery and myself were to the community. Mm -hmm. um, as I began to learn more about the art business, then I started to see that, okay, we can shift this in a way where we're going to now start to look towards building the market for artists. And in building the market for artists, and then a number of the artists that we represented going on to do extremely well. Now that put us in a position where earlier collectors that purchased the work and then they have something on their walls that appreciated significantly in value. Now those individuals were looking to invest in other artists and then collectors that are out there who are looking at it sometimes from a monetary standpoint 
Now they were starting, our gallery was now beginning to be on their radar. So now they were looking at us as a gallery where that maybe that next young artist is coming through our program that one day we were going to be able to nurture and develop and establish a market for them that they were going to move on to other galleries. So instead of looking to pay the higher price point at the galleries that they're currently represented, let's look at Richard Bieber's gallery. You know, this gallerist put, seems to have a pretty good eye, uh, a pretty good feel on the business aspect of the fine art world. You know, so that really began to open things up for us. Um, and then one of the things that I, I learned too was instead of putting a lot of money into advertising and marketing, to look at social media, you know, and look at that as a vehicle, you know, if you could figure that out, how you could use that to market the gallery. Um, we pulled back money from advertising because we saw that the typical ways of advertising wasn't doing a lot for our program. And then I started to focus on, okay, maybe I need to look at some of these art fairs because I want to build out on the market that we have and giving us more access to, to different types of collectors, you know, more of the collectors that are in the, in the hundred thousand dollar range and up. You know, and that was one of the things that the art fairs did. And then this goes back to what I was saying earlier about us as gallerists working together. One of the first fairs that I did was a Red Dot Art Fair in Miami, and I actually partnered with another gallerist. So we split the booth fair, and that was what gave me my launching pad to be able to now get into one of these art fairs. And that was the first time that I met Miss Peggy Cooper Cat Fritz. Peggy. Miss Peggy, who, you know, uh, you know, God rest her soul. Rest uh, her but soul. she became a major supporter of our program. And then she began to make the introduction to other collectors. You know, so it's really understanding the business, being creative, and you have to be strategic. Very well said. Carla, how are you, given all the odds with the statistics, able to have made it for so long, seven years? When I first started, um, first couple of years, I kept my day job. So the gallery was open to the public all on Saturday and during the week, uh, appo open appointment only. And thank goodness my day job was 15 minutes away from my gallery. So as soon as someone called me and said they wanted to look at a piece, I made an excuse and left a day job or <laughs> tried to schedule my lunch break and uh, ran over to the gallery and showed art and sold a piece and hurried and ran back. Or, you know, I didn't need to tell them what I was doing at my day job. I said, oh, I got an appointment. Let them assume it's a doctor's appointment or something, whatever. And uh, <laughs> went to meet collectors and run back and forth, run back and forth. So my first two years, it was great. I also didn't have funding. I didn't have a loan. But I would rather hustle that way and be exhausted going back and forth, sometimes meeting um, buyers at, right after work, working all day long, going back to the gallery in the evening, making my appointment. And uh, it felt good to know that I don't have debt over my head as I'm starting my business. Um, Richard said a great point, made sure to get a gallery space that was reasonable with rent. Um, so we're in the historic warehouse district area, which there are a lot of other studio spaces around, but I'm the only, um, gallery in the area. So it already was an artsy area and people knew about that art community. And so it was a great, great location. Um, we also had weddings, again, the private events brought in and those specific private events, um, that are more classy or nicer. And sometimes the bride and groom would buy a piece because they wanted to remember, oh, this is a gallery we got married in. So of course we want to buy a piece, hang it up on the wall that this was, you know, the gallery we were married in. So we've had multiple weddings, multiple fundraisers, a lot of private events and spoke with certain artists. Like if you're you know, getting your name out there. I'm doing, they knew I, I was very transparent. I let the artists know, look, this is something that I want to do. I do not have previous experience, but if you want to get in the trenches with me, let's just see how this goes. And they were like, yeah, I mean, we're just excited that you're having a space and we have somewhere to show our work. So I started with uh, several artists that were extremely supportive, that we had a lot of trust. A few of them had a key to the gallery, said, hey, we have a collector coming by wanting to look at your work. I, I can't get away from work. Can you go over there and can you talk to them? And I just made sure that some artists don't have business skills and don't have salesmanship. So we sat and we had a few meetings and we talked, okay, this is a great way to kind of close a sale. This is a great way to make them feel comfortable and discuss that piece. 
And I had to be honest with them. If they came and they looked at your piece, but they may have wanted to buy another artist piece, are you comfortable selling them that piece? And, you know, is that going to be okay and not a problem? And if you sold it, then you're going to get a 5% commission because you were here and you made the sale and I couldn't be here. So the artists, we all worked as a team. So I still feel like it, it started as a collective even though now I'm able to do it full time and treat it more like I would want a gallery to be run. I was very honest that this is a team effort, everyone. Let's get together and let's just make this happen. And I think that is what, you know, made us stay for such a long time. And we've had ups and downs. We flooded in Harvey. Um, so that was a rebuilding process, but everybody rolled up their sleeves and artists came and we rebuilt and I have some artists that thank goodness they're work, they work in construction and we were able to rebuild with very, very minimal costs. Um, so I, I've been very fortunate. And it's beautiful because the resonating theme is the creativity yes. that everybody implies, not just into your artistic views of curation or creating art, but in your approach to business. And our story mirrors every one of yours, watching Danny, engage sponsors in a way that I had never seen before it was very helpful because after the first recession we realized that 95 percent of our collectors were invested in real estate and the real estate market tanked so of course we were at a space and it was mixing the mixture of the business from mostly consumers to corporations so that was our first recession hope. So this second recession has been a new challenge, but our breakthrough or our pivot was really investing in the internet and a virtual experience early on and really looking at what was, uh, what were a lot of the big galleries doing and a lot of them were still using uh, slideshow technology as I was watching it. So we really just looked at other technologies. So technology has been our pivot in this most recent situation with COVID. And I want to end with that. What is your pivot as a gallery and as a gallery who's used to being a survivor and figuring things out when you don't have those advantages? And I'll start with you, Danny, as it relates to COVID. And we'll, close. Uh, well everything we do now is online. So, I mean, uh, like, like Richard shut down in March, so did I, uh, towards the end of March. Um, we developed four core programs uh, for online. Uh, our children's art class on Saturday morning is online. And that's been kind of really cool because now we're getting children from all over the country that log in and, you know, uh, participate in the class. Then we expose what we call the artist of the week. We have an exposure thing where we profile an artist, give them, you know, show their work, your know, bio, blah, 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 blah. The third thing that we do is a, uh, like what we're doing now, uh, artist conversation, uh, uh, where several artists sit down and talk about a subject. And so we've done that a couple of times. And then the last thing we do is this art, a virtual studio tour where artists take you through their studio talk about their work, show their work in progress, show all the work that they have. And so these are ongoing rush programs that go on. Right now, we also, not knowing how long this is going to be, we're building a uh, online gallery. Um, and so that'll be a fifth program. Uh, some of these things will continue after we open our doors because we've developed a nice audience that before a physical place, were, was not able to meet because people now can access us from anywhere. So we're going to still continue the, the kids' art classes and still have a, uh, a physical art class. And we're not sure how that's going to work. We might film the physical art class and invite people virtually into that. Uh, we're going to have the online gallery. So now I have two galleries because I had two store spaces in the building. I have a solo gallery and a group show gallery. And I think we're now going to have a third and online gallery. So every gallery period, I think it's every six weeks, we'll have three different shows going on. Um, and so all of these programs, we're not going to end with COVID ending. We're going to see where they fit and how we can move forward into the digital world because that's the world that people, uh, we're sitting here doing this. We feel comfortable doing it. And we're able to reach 
Like this will reach more people than if we sat in any one of our galleries. You know, when this is pushed out there, our conversation could reach thousands of people. So I, th I think it's important to think of not only this as a stopgap, but a way of the future also uh, of engaging. That was that. Richard, survivor, COVID, what does it mean for you going forward, your pivot, and what would you advise a gallerist at this time? Um, for us, or, or for my gallery, you know, I, I actually started to kind of rethink and reapproach our business model uh, about two years ago. You know, where we were open from Tuesday to Sunday, we actually changed it around to being by appointment only Tuesday through Friday and open on Saturdays and Sundays for the community so that they would still have access. Um, we don't have a huge staff. Uh, you know, I have a, um, I have a artist, I have a consultant that works with the gallery, but it's not full time, you know, so for us, it, or for galleries, I would say your overhead, you know, you, you really have to rethink your overhead. Um, we've been really fortunate that, like I said earlier, uh, we've been able to really establish a strong market for a number of the artists that we represent. And we've been able to not only sustain, but continually sell work because there's such a high demand for those particular artists' works. You know, so we've, we've had, we have a wait list for maybe about, we have a wait list for about three of our artists. Um, and then being able to use that as an opportunity to introduce new artists that are coming through the gallery. Uh, you know, so we use a lot of private sales. Um, you know, like Danny said, the gallery has not been open since March. You know, so um, we use social media to introduce new works um, because a number of art collectors do follow us. So that's kind of like our catalog now. You know, so if we put a new work up and we put a description of that work, I tend to get a text message or an email or some sort of inquiry about that particular artist's work. Um, you know, obviously we have to move more towards the digital world and, and understanding how to, how to use and maximize technology um, to be beneficial to our businesses. Uh, I'm really looking forward to opening back up again. I'm looking forward to the art fairs. The art fairs have now gone virtual. Uh, you know, so there's so much that is still a lot of uncertainty around it. You know, so I've kind of pulled back. Uh, I've done a number of um, virtual uh, panel discussions you know, so this way I can get the name, the gallery out a little bit more, get my face be more visible where before I was more so in the background and very comfortable with that position. But I know now since, you know, since COVID, you have to be a little bit more visible. Um, I would also say, I, I would say that ultimately, um, you know, just don't panic, you know, just to be patient. You know, and to continue to network, um, you know, build on your relationships with collectors. You know, once you have that trust with collectors, the works that you do present to them, they're always going to be open, you know, open-minded to it and have a long-term plan. You know, you, you have to have, you know, you have to have money set aside, you know, for when times like this do come up. And lastly, what I would say, and this is very important to institutions and galleries, you put so much work into building a market for artists that we represent. A lot of galleries do not collect the work of the artists that they represent. Even if it's one or two works, you know, at minimum, you try your best to have one work of an artist that you represent so that when that work, that artist's work appreciates and value more, now you have your gallery inventory, you know, and you have some something substantial in that inventory that you've collected over the years of the artists that you've represented. You know, I don't know how many gallerists that I've talked to that, you know, older gallerists that don't have any inventory, you know, they don't have any gallery inventory. And I've learned through working with some of these other galleries and having access to some of these institutions that that is where their bread and butter is. It's in the inventory that they've been able to collect over the years. Nice, very well said. Carla, what's the pivot? Uh, I, 
just listening to what others are letting me know in different industries. But again, I work with an artist or two that are in construction and they are extremely busy. So right now people being at home want to do self-improvement. So I've utilized contacting more interior designers, um, commission work. We've had several, several commissions. So um, also of course the virtual galleries of what we're showing, but um, murals for in-home murals, also some other, um, some resin poor artists that I also represent have kind of had a relationship and communicated with construction workers that there's some resin poor pieces um, that are being combined with bar tops and surfaces and everything like that too. So we're just being extremely creative and looking to see what work is being done and where are people still spending money and people are definitely looking around in their homes and wanting to upgrade what they have. Um, so that's been very helpful. And again, online sales has is, is picked up more since COVID than I've ever had in the past few months. I've never had a consistent amount of uh, sight unseen pieces purchased online. So I'm really excited about that. And right now, so our, we have scheduled on the books uh, a solo exhibition for September 19th. And what we're doing is scheduling or at, requesting people to RSVP and breaking it up in hours. So asking, are you going to come from five to six? Have that small group of people come during that time slot. Are you going to come from six to seven? Have those people, now you have a time slot. So hopefully we have no more than 10 people in the gallery at the same time. Of course, face masks. We're lucky enough to have a beautiful patio in front of our gallery. So we'll probably have refreshments out on the patio and continue to social distance. But we, we feel pretty comfortable that we have a plan to have our first uh, solo show in September. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, First and foremost, I just want to say thank you to all my peoples here, because all y'all my peoples now. And Richard, we got to start that exchange. We used to do it with our jazz gallery. We've done some things with Rush. But I think to your point, collaboration amongst us is important. But even more importantly, I'm going to close with the whole culture has a responsibility as activists. It can't be on Danny, Richard, Carla, and my shoulders only for our whole culture because there are so many thousands of people who've collected our works individually and cumulatively that we're in this together. And we yeah. need them to be activists, that they're on boards and they know how to get some black art and corporations, do that work, make the referrals, refer our galleries, but most importantly, understand our culture is dependent on the survival of our institutions. And for that, I thank each and every one of you for your dedication and your hard work. And the Houston 